welcome back to the lab. Today we are going to take some steps that will cause components to literally melt themselves off of our board. Transistors will die, but if I have my way, today we are going to fix our snubber once and for all. It's Wild West time and there will be component overstress. What's this whole deal with the snubber anyways? How can it be broken? Why do we need to fix it? Those are some thoughts that come to mind for me when I'm thinking about a snubber, especially when I was first getting introduced to the concept. So a snubber is a resistor capacitor pair that dissipates power to limit voltage transients in a system. Ours is broken per se because it is not effectively limiting voltage transients. This failure then causes our transistors to fail because too much voltage is applied. Now this is a problem for two reasons. First, it's a problem because our UPS can't achieve the intended maximum input voltage, which is a problem. But second, and in my opinion more importantly, this is a problem because we have not been able to stress our system with an appropriate power level. And there are likely more fundamental problems in this UPS architecture that are being masked or hidden by this obvious problem. If I can fix this obvious problem, if I can fix our obvious snubber problem and get more power out of this UPS, that opens up an opportunity to find even more room for improvement in our architecture. All right, before I go full analog nerd on you, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that we have been talking about snubbers a lot. I've said that word quite a few times, and if memory serves, we haven't actually described how it works. So allow me a moment to break this situation down into principles we've talked about before. When driving an inductive load, current builds up in that inductance. After some time, we may decide that we want to turn that inductor off, but there's only one problem. Inductors try to maintain a constant current, so there can be massive voltage spikes when trying to turn one off. Now there are a couple ways to deal with the energy that's creating that voltage transient. The first, most common, love it, clamping. Clamping diodes are great. We had a whole video about it a while back, so check that out if you want more detail, but Basically, they dump this extra energy into a voltage rail, and that actually causes it to be mostly stored in the bulk capacitance and used later, so it's not all wasted. Sweet. There's only one problem. We need a voltage rail, and we need a voltage rail with a higher voltage than what we would normally see on that inductor in order to really do this. For a push-pull converter, the voltage we need to snub is twice as large as our highest voltage rail. We don't have anywhere to clamp Two. So what's the solution? There's a couple solutions, but the one that I think is used most common is a traditional snubber. A snubber, like we said, is that combination of a resistor and capacitor. The capacitor exists to achieve two goals. The primary goal is to achieve resonance with the inductor, causing energy to slosh back and forth. The secondary function is that it actually needs to be able to store the amount of energy stored in that inductor. If the capacitor is not appropriately sized, voltage overstress can occur because the voltage will go up too much. The resistor in this circuit exists to dampen or attenuate this oscillation. Every time energy wants to move between the inductor and capacitor, it needs to go through that resistor, and it just sips a little bit of power. And this combination of components limits the maximum voltage applied across, for example, the transistors used to switch an inductive load at the cost of dissipating real power in the snubber itself, which limits system efficiency. In our push-pull converter, the inductor in question is the leakage inductance of our transformer and the snubber is required on the low voltage side, low side switches. There's only one problem. The ringing is approximately 200 volts peak to peak and this means that a lot of power could be dissipated in our snubber. When I use typical snubber resistor values and actually achieve that resonance, something in the low hundreds of ohms or so for the resistor, the power dissipated was simulated to be a couple hundred watts. Oh, and I found that for this specific application, using a resistor with a value between 0.1 and 0.33 ohms ten tended to minimize how much power we have to deal with. Little unusual, I might have missed something here. Pretty low values, but just hold on for a moment. These values minimize power dissipation because I found that they tended to minimize how many times energy was transferred between the inductor and capacitor. That's the main reason my power dissipation was reduced. After all, when you're going 
positive 200 volts back down to zero over and over again, that's a lot of voltage to apply across any resistor. So reducing the amount of times that ringing happened is great. And after this optimization, we brought the power dissipation in the snubber down to around 30 watts. Our first implementation used a 1206.33 ohm resistor and two 2512 one mic 100-volt rated caps in series. Yep, in our simulation it works great. On the bench, performance was pretty great too. Uh, these component values did a really great job of keeping the ringing under control. It's only one little problem. Most of you probably ought to caught on to this, but yeah. Power. Our sad little half a watt resistor didn't even stand a chance. If we would have taken a second to think about power dissipation before ordering parts, we would have noticed the 20 watts and picked a more appropriate component. Thankfully, physics is ever so helpful and it reminded me that it's still a thing with a puff of smoke and a resistor literally falling off the bottom of the board after it desoldered itself. Turns out, power dissipated in a snubber is real power. Like we said before, none of that fictional peak marketing watt rubbish, and this real power really caused the components to desolder themselves off the board. Whoops. Bigger components then. Let's buy a 0.33 ohm 20 watt resistor, or, hmm, can't find any of those in stock. All right, how about 0.1? Well, 0.1 seems to be a little more common, so how does that look for power? Changing from 0.33 ohms to 0.1, because there's a slight increase of power from 20 to 30 watts, but I mean, it'll probably be fine. At this point, we're operating so far away from ideal that I can't really be bothered about pushing a resistor to 150% of its rating. After all, 150% overstress is way better than 4,000. Uh, if you're curious about this sort of thing, check out milperf39007. This document gives some great insight into what kinds of overstress may be tolerable for certain applications. It also gives some methods of determining how much peak power a resistor can withstand. In this case, we're actually using wire round resistors. So that's why we're using 39007. We're using the wire wound specification. There's a similar document for thick film or thin film parts. So just use the right document for your application. But anyways, that's not what we're here to talk about. We are here to talk about snubbers. So. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to know more about derating, component overstress, or pulse power derating. We'll cover that separately. But how did our snubber do? How did this new snubber do, the 0.1 ohm giant resistor? Well, not great. It did not great. The parasitic inductance and capacitance of this gigantic wire round resistor hurts performance um, a lot. I mean, at least it doesn't melt itself off the board or turn black, so that's good. Gotta count my small victories here, okay? It's been a rough day, but we found a great snubber with components that can't take the full power, try to scale it up, but then parasitic effects are fighting us when components large enough are used, so... Yeah, this is kind of where we left things. The snubber currently imp implemented doesn't work as well. It works at 11 volts, but not above 13. Then it dissipates 30 watts, which is an ideal, but at least nothing catastrophically fails. I think we need to slow down. We're getting, at least I'm getting, kind of lost in all these details. So let's take a moment to inspect the drain to source voltage stress while operating and let this stand as an example of what happens when every parasitic element of every component is not considered. Assumptions, man. Make the wrong one and you and I could be in the same boat, eating a delicious slice of humble pie. You can clearly see that there isn't much margin here in this measurement. Our 200 volt FETs are subjected to about 180 volts that's 24 volts of real voltage and 156 volts of ringing due to our leakage inductance. So yeah, that's that's a lot of volts. And yep, that's the best that we could do. It's the best we could optimize our snubber to, at least with components that we could actually buy that were readily available. We're dissipating a total of 60 watts, 30 per primary winding. On the one hand, this is better than 200 per 400 total, but it's still terrible. If our ESR calculations for a lead acid battery were correct, this is going to get ugly in a hurry. We're limited to 700 watts from the batteries if my ESR assumptions are correct, and 11 volts is the power limit for our 2S battery pack. Without the snubber, we're gonna be running at approximately 50% efficiency. 
My simulations show this number keeping performance around there, between 40 and 60 percent across load. Could be doing much worse for ourselves, but still, like, that hurts. 700 watts limits us to 280 watts out, and oh, that just doesn't feel good. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with our implementation. Maybe the turns ratio or power output are just too high for the switch mode power supply topology. There's too much energy being captured in the leakage inductance and we just can't clamp it anywhere. There, I just, I'm starting to think this just isn't going to work the way that I want it to. I'm starting to think we're going to need large change to bring this to where I want to bring it. Not properly considering the necessity of a snubber due to the leakage inductance of our transformer ended up pushing this project pretty sideways all of a sudden. We need to pull our UPS back on track, but right now it kind of feels like it's tearing itself apart at the seams. Nevertheless, we need to push onwards, so let's take a couple days to think more about this snubber, and even if this is the best we can do, I'll grab a 12 volt high current power supply so we can push the limits of our UPS as at a lower input voltage, like 12 volts, 30 amps, something like that. And if you like what you saw today, consider subscribing to be notified of our future videos where we'll load test our best implementation of this push-pull converter and test our inverter stages soft start and over current hiccup routines. I think that nothing is perfect, but this project is going great. There's always something to learn when implementing a fine piece of power electronics like this. There are many little details that can really sneak up on a person if not careful. And if you think that you learned a thing or two about snubbers at my expense, let me know by hitting that like button, chatting with us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!